Thank you for joining us. Um, we have a very exciting event today. The Phoenix Sustainable Initiative and the Energy Policy Institute here at the University of Chicago collaborated once again, this time to deliver a joint speaker series and documentary screening of Paris to Pittsburgh. My name is Eugene, and I'm going to briefly introduce the speaker and moderator for this evening. Our moderator for tonight is Amir Gina. Amir is an assistant professor here at the Harris School of Public Policy. He is an environmental and development eco economist, and his research focuses on the role of environment and environmental change in the shaping of how societies develop. He uses applied economic techniques combined with methods from climate science and remote sensing to understand the impacts of climate in both rich and poor countries, and has conducted field work related to climate change adaptation with communities in India, Bangladesh, Kenya, and Uganda. Amir has a PhD in sustainable development and a master's in climate and society, both from Columbia University. Chris Wiggy is our guest speaker, and he is currently the director of strategy and city engagement for the American Cities Ch Climate Challenge at the Natural Resources Defense Council. Chris was former Chief Sustainability Officer and Chief of Policy in the Office of Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel. And I'm sure your experience there will come up a lot in the discussion. Chris also has an MBA from Booth, um, so it's nice to have you back on campus. Please note that we will have a brief five minute transition period between the discussion and the film screening. So if you need to leave, um, please do so quietly. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Amir who will give a very short introduction prior to the discussion. Thank you very much, Eugene. Um, first of all, thank you everyone for coming and thank in, in particular Chris for coming to, um, to talk to us. And I'm very interested in, in picking your brain about some of your experience working in this, this field for, for a number of years now. Um, before that starts, I wanted to give a couple of minutes introduction on, just to set the context a little bit. Um, so just to, to make everyone aware of what we're talking about, this is, the, this is how, in a way, we are thinking about climate change. First of all, what I want you to get from this, it's temperatures in the continental United States through time. And the blue lines are what's happened historically. And the three lines coming out from that are different scenarios of what the future might look like. So one of the things I want you to get from this is, first of all, there's a lot of uncertainty here of how we, as a society, make our choices to move from this red line path, which might see us by the end of the century, things that we, probably everyone in this room, will see in our lifetimes, um, getting to 10, between 8 and 10 degrees Fahrenheit change, um, temperature change, and what the benefits might be of choosing to move onto that lower path, the yellow path here, where we mitigate more of climate change. And so there's a lot of uncertainty there about how we act, and there's uncertainty for what the, the outcomes of this are, and who actually is going to make those changes and make those hard policy choices that are required to move us off those different trajectories. At the moment, we're a little bit closer to the red trajectory here, this type of business as usual one, than we would probably like. Four years ago, um, under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Paris Accord was, was agreed upon, which was a set of voluntary targets which each country around the world, apart from two, um, agreed to to lower their emissions. And the trajectory of CO2 this time, in terms of tons of carbon emissions, that that agreement would have put us on was this light shaded blue line. Just to put the stakes of what we're talking about here a little bit more, um, to bring that a bit more to the fore, the dark blue line is what they had historically been. In the US, we have been declining for, for a number of years. And yet last year, there was a worrying reversal. So if you look at that last data point from 2018, this is what the growth was of CO2 emissions like in the last, over the last four years. And 2018 shows this reversal of trends. People had thought that even without active climate policy, because of different market trends happening in the United States, because of the shale gas boom, because of cheaper energy, and because of cheaper renewables, um, because of existing fuel efficiency standards and other policies, we would continue to see that decline. It turns out that without that concerted policy pressure, that might not be a foregone conclusion. The market is not going to take care of this without some kind of action. This is just showing, again, in terms of tons, what the contributions are to the different um, the contributions from different aspects of the economy are to emissions in this country. And so for the last couple of years, transport 
has been, has eclipsed power as the largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. So that's something where I think cities probably have a, an outsized role to play as well. When thinking about these policies, there's often a reluctance on the political side to engage with them because we think a lot about how expensive those policies might be. I think a lot of the costs of imposing taxes or imposing certain efficiency standards of enforcement of other aspects of the policy. This is from work that, that I've done a few years ago, which focuses on the other side of that equation, which is the benefits of taking some action. So this is under that business as usual scenario damages to the United States economy from looking at a few different sectors. This is definitely not comprehensive. Um, and it looks at the damage of local level incomes. And first of all, um, which you can't quite read from this, this image, but overall there is damage to the US economy by the end of the century due to staying on that, that track of emissions. What you see probably more strikingly in this, which is a topic I hope we'll come back to, is that these damages aren't experienced everywhere equally. In the southern United States, these damages are experienced a lot more. This is, tries to capture what the benefits of action might be. So not just how expensive the policies are, but what the benefits might be of lowering us off that trajectory, of getting us away from this picture of damages, and particularly of unequal damages. And not to put too fine a point on that, just to show you that this is uh, an, an issue at the intersection of, of economics and the environment and actually how we view ourselves as society as a justice issue, if you were to group all the counties in the United States, the 3,000 of them or thereabouts, in terms of richest, poorest to richest, take the poorest 10% all the way up to the richest 10%, here's what the average damages in those counties look like. This is showing that the poorer places in the United States are being affected more by the impacts or might be affected more by the impacts of climate change as we let these emissions increase throughout the 20, 21st century. So this is not just an issue of the whole economy being damaged or the environment being damaged. It's also a question of who gets damaged and where those damages occur. So it has a deeper implication for, for how we think about ourselves as a society as well. So the event here is about cities and about local action. So why cities? Cities are, have a pretty small footprint on the planet. They occupy just 2% of the land area but they use a, over two thirds of the world's energy and emit about 70% or more than 70% of the world's CO2. So a small footprint, but a large player when it comes to thinking about climate change, contributions to climate change, but also solutions to climate change. One of the other things to note about them is about 90% of all cities around the world are coastal. And so they are especially at risk from multiple threats of not just increasing heat waves, but also sea level rise, storm surges if they're on the Atlantic coast here in the States, or we just saw uh, cyclones in South Asia that were um, enormously damaging, but thankfully there wasn't that large of a loss of life. But people here in cities are also at risk from these damages in a way which is um, quite unique and something that we should uh, be focused on. I think that's the end of, of the introduction, and then why don't we dive right into it? So the question that I pose at the top of this, why cities, what is there about what can be done at a local level that maybe can't be accomplished at a, at a wider scale and vice versa? Sure, um, and thanks, good to be with you, Amir, and, and thanks everyone for, for being here uh, tonight. It is nice to be back on uh, campus. I apologize for all the MBA students who yell at you when you're in the Winter Garden uh, and they feel <laughs> like you're intruding their space. Um, so I, I think there's, a, a potential way of, of framing the discussion about why cities and why mayors kind of care about this work. Um, I think that it kind of falls maybe into to three buckets. One, and I would say it's, it's innovation, infrastructure, and inequality. So from the standpoint of innovation, cities around the country, around the world are competing for talent. They're competing for businesses. They're competing for you. Uh, they want you to move to uh, their their cities. Mayor Manuel would spend you know countless number of days at Harvard, at Michigan, at Spelman, at Stanford, trying to recruit students to come to Chicago. Uh, and the effect of that is, as more businesses and corporations think about their own carbon footprint, as they understand and appreciate the vulnerabilities that they have on their bottom line to some of the charts that you showed and that often they're 
housed in cities. Um, that if they are not focused on this work, it creates a competitive disadvantage for those cities and for those mayors as they compete with other cities, other mayors in other countries for that talent and for that work. The second piece is infrastructure. 90% of city, you know, the, with so many cities on, on coast and so many cities having, uh, you know, reeling from the effects of climate change, uh, be it um, Florida, be it New Orleans, be it New York, um, that, uh, you know, we're often trying to build a 21st century economy on 19th or 20th century infrastructure. And that infrastructure was not planned and thought out for uh, the ravenous effects of climate change. They were not planned out for um, storm surges to be as large. They were not planned out uh, for snowstorms to hit for harder and longer. Um, they were not planned out in a place like Chicago for even though you know, the number of rain events may be consistent, the gravity of those rain events are getting worse and worse. And so they, they care not only around mitigation but also resilience and how they're building um, how they're building their, uh, build, rebuilding their infrastructure and how they're doing that, uh, keeping, city, keeping climate change in mind. The third bucket is that, you know, city, every city in the country, I think, is, is grappling, uh, and some cities better than others, uh, around issues of inequality and, and how um, particularly uh, people of color and low-income communities uh, have been crowded out of these uh, discussions, they become the place where pollution is, uh, it sits, whether, and here in Chicago, whether you talk about the east side, um, down at, you know, 121st Street, if you talk about uh, the low village communities, you're seeing those, um, seeing those effects. At the same time, and, and this plays out both in cities and rural, at rural communities, or, or, or ex-city, or ex-urban communities, there's a component of that that fossil fuel jobs often became a ticket to the middle class that, that you have. And e you have that even here in Illinois, if you go down to Southern Illinois, that you still have coal communities. And so it, 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 in those communities, it's playing out in terms of how are we talking about a just transition? And knowing that although from a big picture, you know, the transition away from uh, coal, for instance, is the right thing to do and the right long-term play, how are we also thinking about those impacts in those cities? The flip side to the flip side is that this also creates an opportunity for to, to really kind of rebuild um, uh, America's middle, middle class. And so, you know, one of the things that uh, in my work we talk with a lot of cities about are things like workforce development programs, um, particularly for returning citizens, um, citizens who may have uh, served time and or been incarcerated, uh, and how are we providing, you know, the jobs of the future, these clean energy jobs we talk about. Um, how are those uh, ultimately going to those uh, to, to individuals and communities that may have not seen the benefits of the information age over the last uh, several years, even over the last few decades? So picking up on that, the, your first, on your, your, the innovation point, it seems to me that what I've seen over the last few years is this shift away of thinking from, of just of the negative environmental consequences of climate change, but also thinking of it a little bit more as dealing with it or making policies related to it as just making plain economic sense. So in a way, attracting the right people. And as you were saying just at the end, the um, trying to find the right, trying to use that as a springboard to the middle class or as a springboard to, to um, some kind of economic development for people. And is that a, a change that you have seen during your time with the city of Chicago or, or afterwards? Yeah, I mean, I think that you're seeing there's there's a better appreciation i would say actually for the costs and benefits so there's every you can find every like fortune 500 company has like a corporate social responsibility office and they do good stuff and i, I have friends and colleagues who, who work in them you know but um you're starting to see a shift in the conversation where the environmental work is not in just that corporate social responsibility office, but it's in the procurement department, it's in their marketing department. It, it's beginning to become core to the business. Some of that's a reflection of the clientele and, and how consumer attitudes are changing uh, and how particularly you know, uh, companies in, in, in the information space or the consumer package good space are, are trying to attract certain, uh, uh, certain companies. But it's also, um, you know, those, those costs and effects are, are, are long-term, right? Uh, if you think, going back to your graph about transportation, right? If you're hauling goods 
um, around the country, fuel is a pretty big cost. And often it's one of the biggest variable costs that a business can have. So if you can do things like United has a pilot out in, um, United Airlines has a pilot, I think both in Los Angeles and San Francisco, um, starting to work on biogas and biodiesel. And they're actually using some in small quantities uh, at their airports. And it's, that's an, actually an interesting dual play because on one hand, it helps them from a revenue standpoint because it helps them control their fuel costs, which are, you know, which uh, inevitably almost bankrupt, uh, has the ability to bankrupt several air airlines. Um, but United and other airlines are actually some of the businesses that are most susceptible to issues of climate change. Because when you think about where most air a lot of airports are, they're on the water. Go to San Diego, go to LaGuardia, go to DC, go to National, right? They're, and so they are sincerely concerned that the place where they make their money won't be there in 20 years, let alone their ability to expand. And so I think, the conver I think that the conversation and dynamic is changing. I think that more people are involved in that conversation within businesses and corporations, which is ultimately, uh, ultimately a positive. And it's not, it's no longer, I think the car, and, and it's, there's some of this still here. I'm not gonna, you know, let, let's not, let's be real here. Um, but it's no longer charity. The conversation is starting to move away from charity. Uh, and I think one of the things you'll see in in the in the in the film is is you know discussions about from those businesses about why this is starting to become a core um, tenant to the work. The, another component of that is on the activist side. So if you think about some groups like 350.org and and other uh, organizations that have put pressure on on cities like Chicago, on universities like University of Chicago um, to divest from from fossil fuels. Uh, it becomes a, a humongous factor for the financial community to think about where are they placing their investments, where are they making their bets, where are they making their money. Mm -hmm. So on the, you mentioned the airports. Yeah. Or, well, just a, a brief anecdote on what you're saying. So when I started out on, on doing research on climate change a decade ago or so, I remember there was always this refrain that we had of saying, this is only being talked about in environment ministries, and the envi environment ministry is the least powerful arm of any government. Um, last year, I was at a meeting of central bankers and finance ministers of Central America at a discussion of climate change. And it's this trend that I've noticed um, that was kind of very obvious there, that it's now being discussed, as you say, in completely different halls than it used to be discussed in. Um, you mentioned airports there. And can, can I add maybe one, yeah, uh, yeah. One, one place where it's really being talked, to, talked about are in um, military institutions. Right, the Defense Department, as, as hard as the White House may try, the Defense Department is very clear that climate change is its biggest threat um, over the next several years. Uh, my old boss, Mayor Emanuel, you know, used to say that the next great wars of the, of the next half century are going to be fought over water. They're going to be fought over oil. And so, uh, you know, that, 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 that phenomenon and, and how that from um, refugee crises to displacing uh, individuals to resource wars are, will also manifest itself in a very real way worldwide. Maybe just picking up on that point, the, the, do you think it's, t it's got, gained so much traction among military um, organizations because they're used to thinking about uncertainty, <clears throat> about scenario planning, all the things that might hamper other climate, other agencies from making climate policy is that the answers are, the, the predictions of the future are inherently uncertain, and yet there's institutions that are able to deal with that and have historically dealt with that well. You know, I'm, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm the last person who would consider themselves a military expert, um, but I do think that there is an element of, you know, the uncertainty about where assets are placed, right? They, you can almost make the same analogy to, to companies, right? So a lot of companies, particularly on, you know, areas like food, like coffee companies and chocolate companies are thinking about this because their assets are in places that may go away. And their ability to move goods and people from one place to another may evaporate. And so how do they deal with that? To your point, the military thinks that they have people like in basements of Pentagon, the Pentagon who think about that all, you know, think about that uh, all day. And also they're thinking about what are, what, you know, why do we fight wars? Right, that's that's part of what uh, what they're considering as well, and we often fight wars 
uh, over over resources and one and and water in many places in the world and arguably in many places in, in the United States it's becoming a, a more uh, more precious uh, and um, harder to find resource so back to the infrastructure idea and thinking about airports cities are hard to move they we have our built environment at the moment and there's only certain numbers of changes that we can make to that to retrofit either to protect ourselves so to adapt to climate change or to mitigate some of the effects and um, with your experience in Chicago or elsewhere or even talking a, a bit about the the climate cities challenge um, just how big of a challenge that is the fact that we have these inefficient built structures that now we're in a way fighting against yeah it's for this challenge it's real freaking big, right? Like cities are living institutions. They, 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 they expand and contract over time. And the built environment just can't keep up. Um, Chicago was you know, built for 4 million people, or closer to 4 million people. We got 2.7 um, today. Uh, whereas you have other cities that are part of the challenge, like San Antonio, which is growing at you know basically four percent a year. Seattle, which is growing uh, even faster than that, and so they're trying to trying to keep up with where their population is going. And so, and, and at the same time, you have you know you're you still have fairly tight budgets. You have a lot of cities, and I would include Chicago in 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 this, who are just a couple years out from recovering from the Great Recession of 2007 2008, which put humongous constraints on uh, on a particular municipal budgets and so they are trying to they're trying to figure out how do you fund this stuff how do you uh, how do you ultimately you know do more with less and I think that one of the things that that we work on on the challenge and a lot of entities work on it gets back to what something you're saying earlier how do you integrate climate into the conversation so that when those decisions are being made that that's being accounted for so and that could be things from where you put the bus lanes, or where you put new bus lines or new train lines. Um, where do you put new sewers? How are those sewers structured and sewers set up? Um, where are you building power plants? How are you building buildings? And what are the requirements that you're putting in, either more or less stringent, around things like energy efficiency, accessibility to renewables, uh, et cetera? So, you know, there are a variety of policy triggers that cities have access to. Uh, and I think the, the question is, how do you try to make all of them work um, at, at the same time? Knowing that cities, you know, at, at the end of the day, when most people think about your city, you don't, you're not thinking, you may, it may be very important to you that your city is taking an active role on climate change. But the way you feel your city is when, like, your garbage, well, not for y'all, y'all are in the cocoon of, uh, the Hyde Park campus, but outside of the cocoon of the Hyde Park campus, uh, is the garbage picked up? Is the pothole filled? You know, is the police going to? Are the police and fire going to show up? Those basic city services um, that city halls and mayors have to deal with every day. The question is, how are you balancing and integrating those conversations with the other critical priorities that every mayor and every city faces around the country? Which, if it's a challenge in the US or in Europe or other wealthy countries, is kind of a much larger challenge in developing country cities where they're not even providing some of those basic services uh, to a large degree. Um, so just from your personal experience here, how did you accomplish, how did, how did Chicago accomplish or maybe fail? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on who you ask whether that we accomplished much. to get this into, into the conversation or discussion, what was the, the organizational structure here which helped or hindered that? So um, I think that's, that's a good question. One of the things, and this is to your, to your point earlier about environmental ministers, if you look at uh, where, especially in local government, where the environmental policy and operational work sits, it sits in lots of different places. And I'm going to start talking a lot of just, this will probably only be interesting to the political science uh, majors in the room. Um, but the organizational structure of cities is all over the place. And so, um, you know, when I was, uh, when I was chief assembly officer in Chicago, I was a appointee of the mayor. I, I sat in the mayor's office and, I, and our staff and our arc was largely policy driven. Um, there are other cities around the country where they have like a department of environment or department of, of climate. 
if you look at a city like New York, they actually not only have a sustainability office, they also have a resilience office because they're thinking uh, they're, you know, that, was, uh, that was established after Hurricane Sandy. And so they're thinking about how are they integrating resilience planning so that the next time a huge hurricane uh, hits that you know, they don't lose power for nearly, nearly a, a million different people. And so I think that the, the structure on, on how stuff gets done varies from city to city. What's critically important at the end of the day is, is the mayor bought in? Does the mayor care about this and how does the mayor push or not push this issue? Um, you know, there, there are lots of different structures to, 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 to governments, but really it kind of comes down at the end of the day to whether or not the, the mayor is prioritizing this. Is the mayor talking about this? Is the mayor pushing policies? Is the mayor yelling at his or her staff to go get all this blankety blank stuff done? Um, be it on, um, you know, in Chicago, uh, you know, we, we passed a fairly extensive uh, ordinance that requires all buildings to benchmark and disclose their energy use, all large buildings, 50,000 square feet and above, including several buildings here uh, on the Hyde Park campus. Um, we are now starting uh, later this year requiring that buildings actually put what's called an energy star score. So it's a percentile score um, from zero to 100 uh, in terms of your building energy performance. We're actually gonna start requiring buildings to post that in their, in their buildings uh, and provide that information um, at time of, of lease. Uh, lease or, or sale, um, you know, we, we made a big push around, um, around biking and pedestrian access, both with the, the Divi program, which you see tons of Divi bikes uh, here on campus. Um, the city announced uh, earlier this year that that program is going to be taken citywide over the next few years. And so um, you'll see Divi bikes in every, um, every part of the, in every part of the the, the city um, and also commitments around renewables. So the city uh, committed to for its municipal facilities, so for schools, city hall, libraries, et cetera, that they'll be powered by renewable energy 100% um, by 2025 and doing the march and, and the work there. One of the important things that, so the, the mayor's buy-in and commitment is critical, but the sausage making is also really tough. You, on one of your slides, you put transportation. Transportation is actually a really tricky issue for local governments because, uh, like in, in you know Chicago, we got a government for everything, right? Uh, and so you've got so who runs transportation policy? Well, you got the you have a commissioner of transportation in the city of Chicago. You've got the Chicago Transit Authority, right? Who runs the bus, buses and rail? You've got the regional transit authority that runs the metro line. Uh, and the pace buses out in the suburbs. You have a broader organization called the Chicago Metropolitan Area for Planning, or CMAP, that actually does transportation planning regional wide. So who are you influencing? Who are you trying to get to move? Uh, and even in a place like Chicago, where you know, there's a perception that mayors basically rule by fiat, um, that it's not just as easy as kind of snapping your fingers and saying, you know, so let it, let it be done. And so as a part of the climate challenge, the work I do, we actually are spending a lot of time with cities working on transit and transportation issues because they're really complex and they're really dense. And this is a space talking about innovation where cities are trying to keep up with the regulations, or trying to, try, sorry, the cities are trying to keep up with the innovation. I was in a meeting, um, on the East Coast back in the fall. And this was with a room of uh, chiefs of staff and chiefs of policy and senior staffers from big cities around the country. And I just said the word scooters and everyone like wanted to rip their hair out like the oh God, scooters. And, and, so, and, and so how does, it, how does this now, let's think about it from a climate lens. There's an argument that things like scooters, electric bikes, help close that first mile, last mile issue. Because if I can get on a scooter and take it over to the, to the, um, to the you know, to over to uh, 55th and Cottage Grove uh, and get on the green line there, then I've solved a problem, right? Um, but at the same time, what do you do about clutter? Because they're all over the dog on sidewalk. What do you do about issues of accessibility? What do you do about issues of equity? Because these all run on apps, which is great if you have an app or if you have a phone, or if you have a credit card to pay for it. 
And so the nexus of these issues, particularly on transportation, you're seeing a lot of these things starting to come together. And that's and I think cities are are beginning to wrestle with it in the right way. You're seeing a lot of cities uh, appoint chief mobility officers to think about these issues. Uh, Chicago actually just had a task force on mobility, on new mobility and how to think about uh, these issues. So, so I think cities are, are grappling with it. I don't know if cities yet have great answers. Uh, and I think that this is a, a space where there's, there's still a lot of opportunity for, for interesting policy plays. So that brings up an interest. But another reason of, of why cities or why we should focus on cities as a unique entity is because they face similar challenges. And so clearly through what, the, what you're doing with the Climate Cities Challenge, but other organizations like the C40, for example, is trying to <coughs> share those innovations. How much communication back and forth have you been getting? On, and have you seen good examples of policies experimented on in one city which have then been adopted by by many more? Yeah, I mean, all, all mayors uh, just steal from each other, right? Like, there's rarely a new idea out there. They just, like, find an idea that another mayor did, and then they, like, put the word Chicago on it, and then it seems really new, and then it's, like, awesome, right? Um, so uh, I think that uh, particularly organizations like C40, C40, uh, the C40 Climate Leadership Group, um, it's another entity actually funded by Bloomberg Philanthropies that was developed about a decade ago uh, with this very premise in mind that um, you know, the largest cities in the world face very similar problems. And so how are we bringing those cities together? It's now about, it's now should be called like the C80. Yeah. Uh, so the name wasn't the best of calls, but regardless. Um, so, so yeah, I think that your finding cities are often um, you know, stealing from each other and thinking about each other. And, you know, sometimes it happens at a at a global level. So congestion pricing, I think, is a good example. So uh, New York City is going to roll out a congestion pricing structure that was passed by New York State Legislature. Um, they learn from places like Copenhagen. They learn from um, Stockholm. They learn from London. Uh, and now uh, you've got that happening in New York, and now you've got other cities like Los Angeles and Seattle who are working on it and thinking about it and are really active way. And sometimes you're just stealing things from cities around the corner. You're stealing things from Evanston, or you're stealing things from, um, from, from Indiana. Uh, you know, what I mentioned before, uh, energy disclosure and benchmarking, you know, that really kind of, that took a hold. The first three cities to, to make a lot of noise and move a lot there were um, New York, Washington, D.C., and interestingly enough, Austin, Texas. Uh, and so we all learned from the work and the, you know, the mistakes and successes that they have had as well. One of the reasons I think they steal a lot, I think particularly in the climate space, is there's only so much that a city can do, right? When you think about jurisdictional issues, when you think about budgets, the number of choices that a city is making on climate is far smaller than say the federal government. Cities don't fund research, right? There's not a National Institute of, Institute of Health or an NEA or something to like think about, uh, that that becomes another trigger in terms of like how do we think about climate, climate action, climate work. Um, cities often, because of the structure of state governments, have to be differential to the state. Um, and so they, at times, you know, certain cities don't have the ability to do their own taxes, to like pass a sales tax or something. Uh, or to, in, in, in some states, they've actually passed preemption laws around climate work. So there's some, like, a big thing in a lot of, like, Republican state legislatures is, like, pa pass bans on plastic bag bans. Um, so, yeah. Um, and, and, and so they're preempted by, by the state legislature. So because of that, there's, like, 50 things a city can do. Right, the list, the list is finite. And even that list can be somewhat constrained depending on the structure and nature of, of cities. And so part of the premise behind the work that I do at NRDC uh, and the work that cities do is because that world is finite, it actually creates opportunity to learn and iterate from each other in relatively quick order. So Let's take the tone, make the tone a little bit sadder for a while. What are some <laughs> failures here that you've seen? Some successes too, like, but what have you learned from those failures of cities experimenting and what hasn't caught on as a, as a good idea? Um, 
if any. Maybe you only have. Success. Everything's great. <laughs> Every everything everything is awesome. Um, Maybe so challenges is a better. Yeah, question. I think that. Um, you know, I, I, maybe a couple things to think about is that um, passing policies and making announcements are great. Actually, doing the thing can be real freaking hard. Uh, and you know, and 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 what happens when the cameras go away and the lights go off and your boss has like signed the thing saying they were going to do all these things? Great. Now. You know, you're like sitting behind a desk saying, like, what, what the hell do I do? Uh, and so, um, you know, implementation of government is always tricky and always difficult. And the sausage making associated with that is always where the rubber meets the road. And this is true across any policy, right? Healthcare, po healthcare policy, economic policy, policy around wor uh, workers' protection, I think, is um, so the implementation is always tricky. Um, so I think that that's been, that's been difficult. Um, how cities work with other cities in their region can be uh, difficult as well because cities don't always have good relationships with their with the suburbs um, and or they don't have good relationships with the state government go down go down to downstate Illinois and ask them what they think about Chicago well they want they want to secede from Chicago right there's like there's a there's a resolution in the Illinois state legislature to be like Chicago, y'all go over there, and Illinois will hang out here. My personal opinion is great, but um, uh, pro promise. Um, but anyways, so because you need the cooperation of other cities, the interests of those cities are are very different. Um, the mayors of of Evanston and Oak Park do have a concerted interest in Chicago being successful because it makes the region successful. They are also not elected by the residents of Chicago. They're elected by their own residents, right? And, 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 that's not, and I'm not trying to disparage them in any way, shape, or form, but that can be a difficult balance in terms of how you cooperate and work. And, and that's when it manifests itself in things like uh, what happens in a state legislature um, and whatnot. I think that the, the, the other piece here, and this is this can be tricky, and and we fight about this at at NRDC. Is do we focus on emissions reductions to the detriment of everything else? And how draconian, from a policy standpoint, should we or do we need to be? A lot of this came up in the discussions that were around the the Green New Deal, right? Uh, about uh, which one talks about the magnitude, and 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 you know, I, you can think about whatever you want. The simple fact that like we're having this discussion about the Green New Deal, I think from a decade ago, right? Like if you're like, this is the thing we're going to talk about. You're like, really? We're at the point where we're having this discussion. So it, it says something about where the discussion debate has gone. Um, but you know, how far do you really want to go in terms of, and and how big is the problem, and who gets caught up in that? So going back to the inequality discussion we were having yeah. earlier, right? Um, you could mandate today, um, you know, buildings adopt something called the net zero building code, which basically, you know, means that, that you're using net zero power, which has tremendous emissions benefits because um, from your chart earlier, for cities, it's really buildings and transportation. Like that, that's 95% of the game. That's great. What it's super expensive. Today, it'll probably be different 5, 10, 15 years from now. Well, we have an affordable housing crisis in Chicago. So, are you are you okay with less affordable housing being built um, while still meeting emissions targets? That's a very absolute that's a very like absolute example. I'm not saying like that's what's what's happening, but those are the choices and trade-offs that we have to think about. How, going back to infrastructure in the built environment, um, you know, we have to see dramatic reductions in single occupancy car use. And Chicago is better than a lot of cities, but it still ain't great um, on, on those issues. Well, what do you do, um, and what do you do on 81st and Halstead? Or maybe even a better, a more clear example would be um, a place like 120th Street, 
where you are two miles, if best, um, from the red line. Okay, so you're going to tell that person you don't get to have a car anymore? Because um, they got to get to work. Yep. And, and, and so I, I think that that is one of the pieces that, that we continue to wrestle with. And that, and that, that ultimately, that, that becomes, that's what public policy is, right? Public policy is choices. And wrestling with those choices on a daily basis, knowing that sometimes one thing has a prioritization, sometimes another thing has a prioritization. What you'll see in the film is that sometimes you don't have to pick, which is a nice thing. You'll see stories about um, returning citizens in, in California and farmers in Iowa uh, who are working on, on, on renewables. And so, so finding those nexus, um, nexi, nexi Someone here knows the right term. Um, uh, is yes, uh, is 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 really critical, and we keep looking and we keep trying to find those 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 unicorns. It's a big, and it's good because I, I I wanted to try and end on this point, this inequality point. Anyway, it's it's an interesting thing that you raise, which is that there's work and there's evidence now showing that it's people without any kind of political involvement or voice or lower income who are more affected by the consequences of, chi of climate change, which is already happening to some extent around the US and definitely in other countries. Um, but there's also the point that you're raising is that people can be more affected by the policy solutions to those, to those problems. So policies that are created to help decrease the impacts on a, on a certain low income com community could end up disadvantaging them in, in some way. Do you have, so from your own personal examples or yeah. examples experience or from, from the work that you're trying to, to spread, the, 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 the information you're trying to spread with the, with the cities you're working with now? Sure. I mean, How do you ensure that, that, that people so, don't lose out on either end of that? Part? Yeah, I, sometimes we don't get it right. Um, and I'll, I'll like an example, and it's not climate related, but it's environmental related. I did. When I was Chief Sustainability Officer, I did a lot of the work on Chicago's bag tax, right? So seven cent tax for all dispo disposable bags. And so we spent a long time wrestling with the issue of do we charge that to all Chicagoans? Um, or do we provide exemptions for um, folks who are on, um, on assistance programs, low income residents, low income communities? Et cetera, and because seven cents multiple times a week starts adding up if you're on a fixed income, um, or if you you can't keep food on the table, um, and which you know tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of Chicagoans deal with on an annual basis, and uh, and that one that was a tough call, you know where we ultimately landed is that um, is that from a blight standpoint, um, that you know, people in lower income communities get to uh, deserve the right to not have bags strewn over their all their communities as well. Uh, and we ultimately believed in the impact and effect um, that the bag tax can can have. Now that one we got relatively lucky because we saw um, um, uh, across communities and in, in uh, around the. Around Chicago, that we saw, you know, pretty good up to or pretty good reductions in in, in bag use, uh, and so we we were we didn't see as much of the disproportionate impact. I think on something like congestion pricing, mm -hmm. now thinking kind of future forward, um, something like congestion pricing, where you're charging to come into the downtown core or or, or you know a certain area of the city, um, that is manifesting itself in, in, in a real in a very real way. Going back to this concept of transit deserts or communities uh, in cities where you don't have good transit access. So you don't have good transit access. So that's strike one against uh, someone. And, and that could be for political reasons. That could be for reasons of institutional racism. Um, so uh, then you're making them drive. Uh, and now you're going to charge them from coming into an area. So like you may have to come downtown. Let's say you want to start a small business. Well, if you want to start a small business, you probably got to come to City Hall at some point. So if we charge you six bucks to come to City Hall, and it's City Hall, right? So we're going to like run you around with a bunch of red tape 15 or 16 times. They're going to come over and over again. Um, you know, should we be charging um, that, uh, you know, that, 
that person just trying to start a small business the same amount as we're charging a truck uh, or a bus or, or a, lim a limousine. So the, those disproportionate impact, and they're, and they're thinking about this in New York as well. Do we charge the same amount to Uber or Lyft? That's very much an issue. In, in, in cities. So uh, it, it really is manifesting itself in terms of the stick and how this and how this how the stick is brought brought on. The other component where I think it, you are seeing some success in some communities is bringing more voices to the table uh, and broadening the conversation, uh, particularly around disinfected communities. So as we're thinking about policy making, um, what are is it just like the solar companies? Uh, at the table? Is it just like the environmental groups at the table? But how do we make sure that environmental justice groups are a part of it? How do we make sure that houses of worship and communities are a part of those conversations? How do we bring young people into those conversations in a real and meaningful way um, to make sure that it's not just like, it, it's, it's not just good enough anymore to just like not screw things up. Uh, the question is how are we actually making things better at the same time? So last question for me is, and I have to critique uh, the federal policy at the federal level in this country where a large proportion no. of policymakers choose to use the word believe about facts, which is kind of a dangerous uh, rhetoric to start. But where there's effectively a vacuum in federal policy, how important are things like the US states climate alliance or the group of states who said, we're going to stick to the Paris Accords or the climate challenge or the C40 or other things in putting pressure back? Or is that just, is it a lost cause? Well, Can this be accomplished as well without federal action? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put the policy question back to you. I'll answer the political, I'm a political hack, so I answer the political question. So from a political standpoint, I think it's critically important. Because I, I ultimately, and I, and I do get a little concerned about this also on the, on the political side. It's like, oh, well states and, states and cities will just solve it all. No. We can't abdicate the responsibility of the federal government in this work. Um, but I do think that where cities, states, counties, companies, and other entities are important is that it keeps the pressure on. It keeps the, it, it keeps the discussion. You know, the, the, the climate challenge is not just in um, Boston and Seattle and Chicago, like the usual suspects. You know, we work with Albuquerque, and we work with Indianapolis, and we work with St. Petersburg. Uh, we work with San Diego, uh, which is the which has a Republican mayor, the, the biggest city in the country with a Republican mayor, who is very aggressive, uh, actually, on these things like transit-oriented development, reducing parking, and things like that. So I think there, there, is, there is tremendous political value to keep it in the conversation and keep it a part of, of, of what's happening, and, and also putting pressure from a tactic standpoint, on moderate Republicans to recognize and understand that this issue is not necessarily going away. And you do see, I think, a, a slew, not a humongous, but a, a critical mass of, of moderate Republicans in, in, in Congress. You see some Republican governors. Massachusetts has a, a Republican governor, has had a pretty good track record on climate issues uh, during his tenure. Uh, it continues that conversation, continues to push. It may not be as aggressive frankly, as, as, as progressives would like. Um, but that's, that's politics. That's, that's policymaking. So, um, Professor, what the fancy charge. So what, 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 is the, uh, what is the, like, how can cities and states move that? Can they get us away from the red? I'm going to sidestep your question a little bit. OK. Um, I don't think the fancy charts are sufficient. I think, actually, it's interesting that we're sitting having this conversation from the, from the research side and, the, and the, the political side. I think, and it's one of my personal pet topics, um, is how do you make research actually matter? How does it affect something and change, change policies or change the world in the way that you're, you're expecting, that you would expect it to when the information is there? And it's not as simple as just saying, I've got the facts now. Everybody has to pay attention to me. It, it's, it's hard work. And you need to put in the, the shoe leather to, to sell your research, to go to the people who can actually implement those things. And I'm never going to be able to make a policy, even though I'm working at a policy school and discussing policies and criticizing them all the time. But people can do those. People can make them. People can put, those, um, put policies into place. 
think about all of the different actors, things that I'm not equipped to think about. And that two-way conversation, it shouldn't just be me saying, here's what I'm interested in from a research point of view. Now go and work on that because it's the right thing to do. But actually having a bit of a two-way conversation which says, what are, the, what are the research or the policy priorities that you want information on? And then trying to make sure that that's tailored and making sure that that conversation is always going in two ways. And I think that's one of my, my thoughts on what that solution there is. That makes sense. The, the, other, the other policy piece I, I don't want to miss is that cities and states are a place where innovation happens. They can be more nimble than the federal government. And so the ability to, to going back to the earlier discussion about you know, trying new things, it creates opportunities to, to, to get policy right before it goes to the federal level. That's another reason I think this, this space is, is, is critically important. You're seeing, at least during the Obama administration, you saw the federal government starting to move to benchmarking federal buildings and providing that information publicly. And so I don't think that happens if you don't have New York and um, and DC, the District of Columbia, uh, and Austin move forward first. Mm -hmm. So cities it can be these experimental labs yeah. to test out our policies. Mm -hmm. Okay, on that note, I think we should open up for questions, and we'll have probably 10 minutes or so, and mm -hmm. I think there's a mic going around if you have questions for Chris. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I was wondering um, to our guest speaker if um, there is a city not in the United States that you've really admired in terms of their climate initiatives, and also what kind of lessons you've drawn um, from speaking with other policy officials from cities not in the United States? So I think that that's a good question. I think, and at least in Europe, the example is always Copenhagen, is what everyone goes to, because everyone's got a bike, and they, and they charge you for everything, and, um, and it's this utopia, right, of quasi-socialism. So I think that, um, but you know, Copenhagen, Co Copenhagen is actually an interesting example because of water. Right, water is a very real issue uh, in that city, and, and and which is one of the reasons they have to think about climate change um, so proactively. They've also turned it on its head and used it as an asset. They are now one of the biggest innovators on <clears throat> things like flooding and resilience technology, and so they have been instrumental, I think, in a lot of work. I know that um, Mayor Manuel, the 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 city, helped create something called Current, which is a not-for-profit that works with private entities on water technology. And he, you know, the places where he looked were Copenhagen and Israel as the two uh, areas for uh, technology, because both of them have water crises. The crisis looks different depending uh, on, on those different areas. But I think that, that that's, the, that's the one city, like when I would talk to sustainability directors and whatnot, it's like, yeah, it would be, it'd be, wouldn't it be nice to like be the sustainability director of Copenhagen, where like everyone loves all this stuff all the time. Hi, thank you so much for reflecting on your time with the city, especially with your eye on equity issues. I really appreciate that. Looking ahead to your new role now with the NRDC, can you share some of the NRDC's policy priorities? What are some things you're working on now in your new role that you'd like to share? Sure. Um, and, you know, for a little bit of context, the Natural Resources Defense Council works on a ton of things, right? I, I work on one particular project, the, the climate challenge, but from active litigation, uh, they, they like we basically like sue the Trump administration like once a week there but and that, that's not hyperbole we like sue the Trump administration once a week um, but active litigation at the federal state and city level uh, on on climate and nature issues a, a huge arm of the organization works on issues around nature protecting uh, protecting wildlife uh, protecting uh, protecting species and protecting uh, open spaces. It has a science center that works on on, on these and has uh, has PhDs um, who work on these issues. I do think that the the organization has embraced and understood its role in fighting the Trump administration, and um, that it becomes critical for environmental groups and people who care to, to to stand up and say no. And that you can say no in a lot of different ways. You can say no in the courts. You can say no in the ballot box. You can say no through your activism and your voice and your agency. And so, um, you know, th and that's not to say that everyone spends like we all kind of walk around saying like I hate Trump and, and focus on that. One of the things you see, and, and one of the reasons I think that that Bloomberg Philanthropies partnered with NRDC around the around this work is that NRDC is more and more seeing its role in cities and seeing the importance of of that work. Uh, I think that uh, NRGC has for a long time had, an, um, had a, a large team in China. 
and I think they're focusing more and more on city issue and urban issues in, in China, despite the difficulties of working and being a not-for-profit in China. Um, they are spending more and more time thinking about environmental justice issues. Um, you know, it's interesting. I used to fight with NRDC, like in my old role, like like I like I like I was a city official, right? And we have tremendous environmental justice issues. And then I went and went and worked there. It's like, hello, colleague. Um, <laughs> this isn't awkward. Um, so, um, but I do think that that NRDC in general has has taken uh, a much more aggressive path on uh, on those issues. I also think that uh, on on urban issues. I also think that. It is embracing its role as an advocate uh, at the at the state level, and so you can walk into you know uh, over a dozen state houses probably today, and there's someone who works in or for NRDC in that state house today fighting uh, for environmental issues. So so taking the advocacy role, taking the policy role uh, on issues of transportation, on issues of, of of energy, in addition to what you would think of as quote unquote core environmental issues around species, around wildlife, around water uh, is, is, is where the organization is, is focused. Uh, I want to ask a follow-up on something you just said, um, both in your old role and now in your new role. Uh, what do you think the relationship is usually between cities and advocacy groups? Do you think it's more competitive or more cooperative? It's kind of a frenemies um, situation. I think that... Um, uh, sometimes we work together and sometimes we, we, we fight each other. You know, one of the realities of politics and of government and, and governing, and I didn't appreciate this before I came in, is that um, uh, you, that alliances change and shift over time. Uh, and they change and shift over uh, subject matter. And so NRDC or other environmental groups is a good example sometimes. And, and you saw this even in the Obama administration, right? Uh, I, think, I think you took a poll of NRDC employees of, of would they take Obama back. I think you kind of know what the result would be. That didn't mean that NRDC didn't fight with the Obama administration. Uh, and that doesn't, that, didn't, that doesn't mean that, um, that they didn't continue to serve you know, their advocacy role. At the end of the day, that they are they are steward. It, it's the it's called the Natural Resources Defense Council for a reason, right? That doesn't all mean that it always agrees with every elected official or every Democrat. Uh, it does it, uh, and and often NRDC works with Republicans um, on 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 wildlife issues and and other clean energy issues. Um, so I think that it by by its very nature because of the decisions that elected officials have to make and the balances that they have, that they're never going to be lockstep with a certain advocacy organization, a certain business, a certain person. And that's OK. Like that's, that's, that's democracy. Uh, and, and, um, and what you have to understand and remember, I think, when you're working like in a political staff or, or working for an elected official, is that uh, just because like, you can disre argue with this person today, but no, tomorrow you may end up working together. And I think that that is kind of the, and, and it's, it's important, I think, for elected officials uh, to, to keep the ability to do that because the issues of the day uh, change, um, you know, uh, change, change every day. We were that good. Hello, thanks so much for being here. Um, my question is you talked about the competitive pressures that encourage cities to innovate. But there's also a lot of competitive pressures that are pushing cities away from taxation regulation. So how much pushback have you seen from within city governments um, around fears of scaring away employers or potential employees? So I think um, I think some, uh, to give you a succinct answer, um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk more broadly and then I'll bring it back to, to the environment and, and climate. Um, I think that. What, what I've seen more so on, on, from, from businesses and corporations, it's, it's certainty. Actually, what, what, they, what they, going back to the planning question from earlier, what they're often looking for is certainty in regulation, certainty in, ta certainty in taxation, uh, and that they can plan around whatever, the, they can plan around a tax rate if they know what the tax rate is. Now, cities, states, federal government, we got bills to pay. We got pensions to pay. We got basic services to provide. 
Um, so we can't just say, well, this is tax rate. It's going to be the same for the next 50 years. But I do think that often it's the certainty around regulatory structures that, that uh, businesses often um, are, are looking for. I think when it comes to issues around the environment and climate, it plays out in a few different ways. Um, from a taxation standpoint, it does, it's not as, as large. It does play out in terms of regulations that may be put on for things like industrial developments. So what is the environmental cleanup that's associated, uh, that's associated uh, around it? Um, you know, for things like benchmarking, uh, for instance, where we're, we're placing requirements on buildings. Who's paying for that, right? Uh, upgrades to buildings come at a cost. So who's going to foot? Who's going to foot the bill? Um, so the, it almost gets back to this advocacy piece as well, right? That we, you may not necessarily agree all the time with the with you know certain communities or certain entities. That also falls on government to do a good job of governing. Um, so a case in point, we did this energy benchmarking ordinance where we're disclosing information. Uh, I think it passed in 2013 got 17 no votes uh, in the Chicago City Council out of 50. That's a lot in Chicago City Council where every, right, where everything, where a lot of stuff becomes 50 to, to nothing. And I think it's a credit actually to Natural Resources Defense Council, to a supermarket transformation, to a lot of my colleagues at the mayor's office who worked really hard in terms of information, good governance, making sure that we implemented the ordinance in the right way. When we then did something far more draconian, where you got to put your energy star score in your in your in the front of your building, uh, we did that in 2017. And it got two no votes, and I think that that's a function of the of both the macro, because the discussion on climate has shifted significantly, and the micro that like government actually got something right, and so it becomes more as 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 we do more regulations as we do more more taxes, it becomes more and more incumbent on government officials to be good stewards of time, effort, and money on the part of residents. Because if you do that, you often get more leeway. Hi. This is going to be a question on the inequality side. Um, so we've kind of talked about cities interacting with other regions. One problem that we've seen with industrial activity and more recently recycling is sometimes problems get exported from the city to the hinterlands or to other countries. How does this work from a political perspective since you know, you're dealing with your constituents here and now? And I'd be curious for your perspective, from a, particularly from an international perspective, on how, how, that, how that development happens on a regional and, and what are the, the byproducts that come from this. Now, this is, this is manifesting itself. And again, it, we, we talk a lot about recycling from an environmental standpoint, I, just the kind of be real here, recycling is a very, like plastics and waste are a very small portion. Chicago, it's about 5% of our emissions come from that. Um, um, but uh, so, but it's playing on recycling because we can't send all our stuff to China anymore, right? Um, and, you know, it, it, that, it's, it's a very fair question because cities are very myopic. It goes back to the Oak Park Evanston example, right? They're very focused on can I move the, this problem out of this city, right? Can I take a job from this city and put it into, uh, into my city? That's where I think the regional cooperation, when it works well, it actually, it actually creates, it creates, good op it creates good opportunities. And when cities are thinking about it in the right way, they know that not every job is necessarily going to be in their city. Not every opportunity is going to be in their city. And so, and I, and I actually do think that in the Chicago region, um, you know, Mayor Emanuel had a good relationship with mayors from mayors around the region and understood that we had to distribute a little bit of the wealth and that, um, that having an awful city, awful, a city that's not growing, not progressing, just like a bad city, like right next door to Chicago is not good to Chicago, for Chicago because people want to live there. People want to you know, uh, spend dollars there, um, uh, et cetera. But I do think that it, it the the myopic nature of cities can make that uh, make that issue particularly tricky, um, um, especially when it's the exporting of bad uh, versus the the importing of good. I don't know if you if 
this well, is just to, to, to add in a little bit. So China is the world's largest CO2 emitter at the moment. And you could say, well, that's Chinese manufacturing is a, is a problem in, in being so inefficient. But a lot of the consumption of things manufactured in China happens elsewhere in the world. And so we're, it goes back to your question, we're counting our environmental damage in a, in a, in a not really in the correct way. Um, what's potentially worse um, is if you try to do something positive about the environment in one location, you can push those negative activities elsewhere. So it comes back to the taxation question as well, actually. If one city has more stringent policies, why don't we just set up our dirty factory in the city next to it or internationally? And there's very little incentive for an individual country to move when you know that there will be this, this leakage or, or spillover effects. And so climate change becomes, on the one hand, intellectually fascinating because it's this massive, unprecedented collective action problem. On the other hand, a really depressing thing to think about because it will require a lot of very innovative solutions and a lot of individual actions to test policies and other things to start off before, um, or, or demonstrating actually that there's positive benefits to uh, um, adopting those policies unrelated to the environmental benefits before people start to, to um, to make policies in that way or enforce them. Um, and it's just, it's a, it's a difficult problem. And that's one of the reasons why I think the, the city's point, your, your final point of um, cities being these good places for experimenting on those policies, at the moment people are afraid to act because we're unsure of what the consequences might be. If you can enact policies at a smaller scale, but a scale which actually has some consequence, um, that actually provides a, a potentially an enormous benefit to, to, to solve that collective action problem. It removes the uncertainty, it removes the fear, um, it might even stoke some healthy competition as people race to get greener, like New York and Chicago would probably yeah, 100%. want to compete with each other in some way. So it comes back to the idea that, that it's a hard problem, but, but uh, having the ability to demonstrate policies that work is probably a, a beneficial thing to, to come around and solve that. I mean, one way to think about it, um, if, if every city moved, one of the advantages of things like C40, if every city moves together, if we could all like tie our hands together in you know, some like weird Pareto opti um, optimal scenario, uh, then we could probably do a lot more, right? Going back to your question about taxation and, and businesses and, um, and, and that. So at times there's a race to the top, at times there's a race to the bottom, right? So, Yes, if every city would commit that we are all going to do a carbon tax together, bam, it becomes easier because then because because then every business uh, has to pay it, no matter where they go. We're all going to do congestion pricing together, easy. Um, the one holdout is where life gets difficult. So if you band a bunch of cities together and say that we're going to move in some way, shape, or form together. It also reduces the, you know, um, it, re it reduces the opportunity costs in terms of in terms of going going somewhere else. Okay, and I think that that's all the time we have.